Welcome back to the MedTech Podcast. I'm so excited to be able to present you guys this episode. I'm joined with an extremely special guest, Shiv Kavglani. He is the co-founder and CEO of Osmosis. For those of you that don't know Osmosis, I'm sure you would have seen their videos on YouTube at least. They are a medical education platform that has been making waves in the industry with its innovative approach to learning. They've been empowering medical students, healthcare professionals, and now patients around the world with their unique combination of AI powered tools, engaging video content, and effective learning techniques. Without further ado, I think it's best if we just dive right into my conversation with Shiv and learn more about the amazing world of osmosis and future of medical education. So as always, if you enjoy this episode, please just make sure you hit that follow button. Make sure you give the episode a thumbs up or a like rating and hit that bell icon. Share off as many friends as possible. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I did recording it. Let's get into it. Shiv, it is amazing to have you on the podcast. Where are you joining us from today? Likewise, Ash, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm in Philadelphia right now for the uh, Osmosis Team Retreat, actually. It's an offsite uh, where about 80 Osmosis teammates are getting together at the Elsevier office here. Nice, great. So Osmosis, wow, this is, this is huge. I'm really excited to get into this conversation. I've been using Osmosis since first year at university and I've always had an issue with the, the, the resources given by the university and I've never actually used them and I've always just relied on Osmosis amazing engaging platform so I'm really excited to get into this conversation so Shiv please just briefly introduce yourself. Yeah totally well thanks thanks for those kind words obviously love meeting people who, who learn by Osmosis and um, also give us ideas on how to improve it so yeah my background um, I am an immigrant uh, my parents um, I'm, I'm South Asian uh, by na ethnicity, um, and my parents uh, were living in Africa. My dad's a retired physician. My mom's a physical therapist, and they were practicing in Africa, in Namibia, where I was born. Grew up in South Africa for about five years, and then my entire family and I moved to Florida, to the U.S., um, and mostly went to school up and down the East Coast. Got really excited and interested in both education, because I saw what it did to my family's prospects. You know, my grandparents were refugees from Pakistan to India during the partition in 1947, uh, and education was their path out, and then my parents' path out, and frankly, mine and my sister's path uh, for, for kind of better, bettering our lives. Um, so education's been something very personally meaningful to me, and then healthcare, too, is in the blood. Um, I, I mentioned my parents are both clinicians. My sister's a dentist. Um, I was always interested in going to medicine, medical school, but initially very interested in surgical devices, like medical devices, um, that's what I studied in college, biomedical engineering, uh, tissue printing and those kind of things, brain computer interfaces. Still very excited about that. But then when I got to medical school at Johns Hopkins, you know, we were like, wow, this the way we're learning could be much more efficient, much more engaging. YouTube was starting to get popular and we're like, we, we need to build something that's a little more exciting for fellow health professional students to uh, to learn by. And, um, you know, the rest is history, as they say. I know we'll probably get into the growth of osmosis, but that's a brief, brief background of myself. Yeah, great introduction. And a lot of that resonated with me as well. My grandparents um, originating from South India and uh, moving across um, from Pakistan to India, across the whole uh, partition and then immigrating to the UK. And so that story definitely resonated with me in terms of education was almost their, their route out, right? So totally. I come from a family where my, my, my parents didn't have the best upbringing. But what my grandparents did do was provide them um, the ability to be able to go to university and get an education. And from that, my dad is now a practicing clinician in the UK, a very, very successful ENT consultant. So yeah, really great sort of meet story. So I think it's best to start off at the beginning with this journey. So tell me, I mean, it's probably going to be hard for you to pinpoint the exact start of your journey, but where, where did this whole journey begin for you, Shiv? Yeah, so osmosis, um, well, first of all, that's really cool. And I've definitely had a privilege of getting to meet people like you who have kind of interesting and similar paths. And, you know, your family went to the UK, my family went to the US. And, you know, what's one reason I think we love these countries is they welcomed uh, welcomed us and um, and many other immigrants and were able to get, uh, you know, from uh, refugees to pretty successful clinicians um, in the course of just 20, 30 years. So, you know, I actually started like week one of med school at Hopkins. Um, you know, my, my co-founder is a guy named Ryan Haynes. My last name's Kaglani, his last name is Haynes. And so we were paired up just alphabetically um, in the same anatomy lab. And he had a PhD in neuroscience from Cambridge. So I spent time in the UK as well. 
And uh, I was, you know, I'd written a book on education before coming to med school. And so we started t just talking as friends about the problems we were facing as med students, which was, you know, you're learning, you're learning things super quickly. A lot of that stuff gets out of date. A lot of the other stuff you forget. And um, we were using very antiquated tools. Uh, most tools you use as a med student or nursing or other student are generic educational tools, mostly built for high school or college. Uh, because there's just many more people and more tech companies serving those markets. So there wasn't that much differentiation uh, for medical or, or healthcare learning. And so we started, you know, identifying the things that make learning medicine different than the things that make learning, you know, language or math or some other fields. And there were really three things. One is, as you know, as a medical student, there's just too much information. It's vast. It's, you know, that's why we have so many specialties. That's why your dad's an ENT and spent many years training in that particular field. Um, Second is it's dynamic. So, you know, what they used to say is that 50% um, of what you learn in medicine is out of date within five years. It's actually now probably faster than that. Um, you know, yeah. we, joined, we joined Elsevier and every year Elsevier publishes uh, close to a million research papers. Those research papers are advancing the science and the guidelines of practicing healthcare. And so you, you as a physician cannot keep up with everything. It's changing too much. Uh, and then the third is high stakes. Right. So if you forget how to factor or you forget how to conjugate a verb, it's not a big deal generally. But if you forget, you know, to prescribe pulmonary function tests to somebody who's taking bleomycin for testicular cancer, uh, you could really F up their um, their lives. Right. Like you aren't you aren't going to give them the right pulmonary tests. And so you know, we were really interested in these three issues. And how do we build a learning platform that took that into account, and made learning medicine more efficient, more engaging? started recommending content, which is why all this generative AI stuff is so exciting now, because it's very much the original vision of osmosis was, you know, you can upload a PowerPoint slide or uh, a lecture from your professor uh, locally, and then you start automatically getting questions and videos explaining it, right? Take this really dense PowerPoint slide and turn it into an assessment item. Um, that exists now with Gen AI, and we, we were like kind of building that in the background. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the beginning stuff. of the story, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, we could probably be talking, I mean, I definitely could be talking for ages about the problems with traditional medical education and the inefficiencies there are in just the traditional learning methods. I, I mean, I had the disadvantage that I was in second year and obviously the COVID pandemic hit and that significantly impacted our education. So we were pretty much stuck indoors for a year and a half straight, just learning from these really tedious, boring lectures, these PowerPoints which of course are very factual and they're teaching us what we need to know, but they aren't very engaging and quite boring. And they would take two hours on end to go through one PowerPoint when I could have easily just learned that information in about half an hour. And so I love that Osmosis has a completely different approach. So it'd be great to talk about the approach Osmosis is taking in terms of the latest evidence-based revision techniques for efficient learning. So we can compare it to the traditional techniques where I know a lot of my peers, they will be putting on uh, a lecture, two hour lecture, let's say at one and a half times speed and making notes. And then they'll make those notes and then go over those notes, let's say a week later, and then those notes get lost in the iPad or wherever. Or some people will decide to actually print out the notes, highlight them. And so those are the current inefficient methods in use. So let's talk a bit about what Osmosis is doing, because it's cool. Totally, yeah. And we have a whole course on how to learn in the health professions and also uh, published 18 peer-reviewed papers about this. So the, the techniques, there's a m number of them. One is called test-enhanced learning. And essentially, it's what a lot of students realize is that uh, you learn better just by assessing yourself. When you actually have to put yourself through a, a formative assessment, um, you, you integrate that knowledge better because that's something about the pressure helps you, uh, helps you uh, actually remember things better. Um, a second is spaced repetition. A lot of people use Anki and these other flashcard apps. Uh, these apps essentially will rely on this research that a German researcher named Ebbinghaus did in the mid 1800s, which was um, about the forgetting curve. It's like, how quickly does knowledge decay once you've learned something? And if you learn it, it decays very quickly. But then if you, you know, a week later review it, and then a month later review that, your forgetting curve starts to, um, flattening and you, you remember it more long term. Um, Another is memory palaces. There's a couple of companies we're friends with like Picmonic and Sketchy that have really gone all in on the memory palaces. Essentially, when you're trying to remember a set of details like microbiology, um, pharmacology of microbiology, uh, you know, you picture yourself in this crazy little um, 
what's, what's called a memory palace, and every item in that palace uh, corresponds to some sort of drug or some sort of uh, bacteria, and it's been a very effective way to like remember things. Um, and then my favorite is the BJ Fogg behavior model, which is how do you change your behavior? And that, this applies more than just studying. How do you become a lifelong learner? It also applies to our patients. How do you help convince somebody or persuade someone or to stop smoking or to um, eat healthier? Uh, and so the Fogg behavior model, uh, we had BJ Fogg on my podcast, Raise Line, is about uh, that you basically behavior is a function of motivation, ability, and prompting. And so osmosis is very much built around all three of those. How do you increase somebody's motivation? But more importantly, how do you reduce, how do you increase their ability by making, say, a mobile app where all their questions and videos that virtualize med school are just in their pocket? And then prompting with push notifications that are more personalized and dynamic. Uh, so those are just a couple examples. And um, I, think, I think there's more to do. Um, the biggest, I think, game-changing thing we did at Osmosis was um, we wrote a paper when we first got started called What Can Medical Education Learn from Facebook and Netflix? And the whole thesis of the paper was that, you know, this like as a med student, we spend more time and, you know, on these tech platforms. Now it's TikTok, but back in the day it was Facebook um, because they have such great algorithms for engagement. Uh, they use, they personalize recommendations. They have short form content that's bite sized and exciting. Um, they add sound effects and um, they are just fun. And we thought medicine can be more fun. Kind of like Duolingo gamifies learning language. We wanted to gamify and make learning medicine more fun. And so that was the thesis of that paper. And that's what what we've tried to do every step of the way at Osmosis. Yeah, you're definitely succeeding because, I mean, for me, learning medicine is fun now. <laughs> it didn't used to be two years ago. But as I'm entering my final year, I'm soon to graduate as a doctor in 2024, I've just realized that, I, you know what, Osmosis has been a huge part of my medical school life just in general so yeah really great and so to get to this point tell me a bit about this journey so you started in first year with your co-founder is, is that ryan you mentioned yeah, right so to, to get to this point now tell me a bit about this process this journey you went on there's a great quote bill gates said which is people tend to um overestimate what they can accomplish in one year and underestimate what they can accomplish in 10 and that's because when you start something, whether it's a podcast or you start a, uh, a business or whatever it is, med school, um, you have all this enthusiasm and passion, especially when you're starting, uh, that you're like, you know, amped up and you're like, oh, I'm going to do this and this and this within the first year. But things take longer than you think. And if, but if you stick with it and you're consistent and you show up every day uh, and you're open to new ideas over the course of several years, you can compound and then be really impressed with what you achieve, right? Like everyone knows the financial uh, examples of compounding if you save a hundred dollars a month or a thousand dollars a month and compound that you know by the end of you know, a decade you have a, a lot more it's an insane amount more assuming the returns are there so for us we took a year off of med school did a tech incubator called dream at health in philadelphia so it's kind of cool to be back where we started here for our offsite. um then i went to hbs uh, harvard business school and did my mba for two years so it was still very much part-time on osmosis as a side project but after 2016, when I finished my MBA, I went full time, basically grew the company for five years straight, raised a seed round and a series A in venture capital speak, um, grew the team from about five people to 80 people um, and grew our user base from about 120 medical students at Johns Hopkins to now over 3.3 million uh, around the world who consume oh. osmosis content. Um, and just kind of kept growing. Uh, initially, it was just direct to students, but then we got uh, some schools that wanted to use it for their um, students and faculty. So we started building out features that were very faculty facing. We started building out a sales team that would take all this interest from schools. Now we have over 200 schools, um, like Imperial College London, King's College London, um, uh, a ton in the US, NYU, Kaiser Permanente and others that, that learn by osmosis. I'm going to Thailand next week. Uh, we have seven, I think, schools in Thailand that use osmosis. Um, so it's grown quite a bit. And then in 2021, the big uh, publishing company, media information company, Elsevier, um, bought us. And so it's been a really great journey even since then. Yeah, great. Congratulations on that. I did end up, I read a, I remember reading an article on that um, when they did purchase it because all of a sudden it went from Osmosis to Osmosis from Elsevier, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, <laughs> and yeah, so uh, yeah, you're doing amazing things in the space. And I think, yeah, it'll be good to just talk a little bit about scaling osmosis up so you said that you obviously dropped out of med school then so 
what year did you drop out of med school? And tell me about obviously going getting into med school in itself is an incredibly some deem impossible task. It's it's very challenging, right? And then to get into med school, you then decided to take a step back. What was going through your mind at that point? Was it just the, the clear focus that you 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 have an amazing idea and you're just focused on scaling it? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't. Um we kind of de-risked a lot of these decisions because we actually wound up, so we got a tech incubator spot, Dream It Health. They gave us $50,000 and a four month program where they mentored us. And um, fortunately at Hopkins, and not all med schools are like this, there is a very, uh, a lot of students take time off to do a master's in public health or an MBA or a PhD. This was not that, but we made the, we made the, um, case that, look, we're trying to build something that improves health education, medical education, so let's take time off to do it. And so fortunately, Hopkins let us keep deferring, so I didn't actually have to drop out, so I'd be risked it. Had I had to be like, drop out, that would have been a much harder decision. Um, Most decisions in life, I feel, are reversible, right? So even if we did drop out, but then we're like, oh, actually, I really do want to be a doctor again, you know, it would have sunk, stunk because you have two years sunk costs of like going through the first two years of med school. But you know, it's two years, what's the two years in the course of, you know, hopefully an 80 year life, um, you go back and relearn it. So, uh, it was still challenging because, you know, South Asian kid, um, spent a lot of time trying to get into med school and then like leaving med school. Clearly my parents and others were a bit worried. Um, but it wasn't like I would drop out to like do like, you know, crypto, uh, though had I invested yeah. in blockchain back in the day, probably would have done even better. Uh, but yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, <laughs> Bitcoin specifically. So, yeah. Yeah. And um, I think that's very interesting, actually, because if you speak to a lot of UK medical school graduates, doctors, they are under the impression we are taught that there's this streamlined pathway that we need to complete as soon as possible. So you finish your, you finish five years, six years of medical school, then you do two years as a junior doctor, and then you specialize for another three years, then so on and so on and so on. And it's almost like a race. You want to finish it as soon as possible. And it's actually, it, it's frowned upon almost if you are to take a, a year back or take a step back or um, just reassess, go a year of traveling even. Um, so tell me, how is that in the US? Is there an, a different approach? Is it almost supported? It Getting to be more like that and depending on the school you go to, right? Like Stanford, I think it's pretty common for students to do other things. Um, most programs, uh, I would say it's 50-50. It's definitely more common now. Uh, my f- uh, friend, a guy named Sherman Long, um, who went to Mount Sinai, is now going into his first year of emergency medicine. He started this community called MD Plus. Uh, There's over 2,500 um, students, I think all over the world, of MDs plus, MDs who do other things, uh, whether that's consulting for like McKinsey or it's starting a company or it's doing some PhD level biotech research. Um, so I think it's getting more common. And I think this like artificial race to finish um, doesn't serve you know, the student or and certainly may not serve their patient because a lot of the most, I think, impactful physicians I've met are people who have really weird and non-traditional backgrounds. Like Lisa Sanders is an example. I had her on a podcast. Uh, she runs the diagnosis column for New York, the New York Times. And also, if you watch Netflix, has this, uh, has a series called Diagnosis for Netflix. Many, many of your listeners, I'm sure, have watched House MD too, a TV show. She was the main medical consultant for House. Anyway, so she, she had a very non-traditional background. She went to Yale for med school but started med school at 37 because she had already done about uh, 15 years of TV journalism uh, before she started med school. But her combination of her journalism background and interest with her medical background and interest led to this incredible you know, resource and career that she's carved out for herself since. Those, I think, are getting to be more the rule than the exception. Yeah, I know we side on a bit, but it would just be really interesting from your perspective, being the CEO of Osmosis, this huge medical education platform, how do you think we address this change, the, the change that has been in medical school for the past hundred years, that it's almost like a competitive rat race. And this is what almost fuels the fact you need to complete your degree as soon as possible, become a doctor as soon as possible. How do we address that? I think it, it starts with examples. So there's a lot of examples of people who've done kind of zigzag paths. And I think um, that that helps norm the fact that this is possible. And those communities of those people with examples like MD Plus I mentioned or Dropout Club. Um, it also then goes into cultural change. So schools being a little more lenient and open to these kind of zigzag careers. Uh, this is one reason we've been built Osmosis is even the fact in the U.S. it's four years of med school. I know in the U.K. it's I think six or seven. Um, 
you know, a lot of this stuff, as you know, can be done virtually and online, right? Like, you know, the, the, the didactic portions especially, if you can learn it uh, instead of a 60-minute PowerPoint, it's a 15-minute osmosis video, and you can do that on your time, you can do that part-time, like you can do a part-time MBA, and just kind of test out of the didactic components, um, and then go into like a hospital setting where you're apprenticing and, cl and doing the clerkships, uh, where you actually get physical patient-to-patient -patient contact. Um, that I think is a is allow us for more flexibility in how we train clinicians, and then also I think a lot of schools need to be thinking a lot more about what does it mean to be a clinician in the next decade, especially as new technology comes out. Is it really the person who has to pass and get the highest score in these different tests? That never excited me at Osmosis. Obviously, we help people with their tests and get through school, but I've never been excited as like that being the outcome of a test. Uh, the outcome is your patient care. Are you able to provide good patient care and see more patients? And clearly, all these innovations we're seeing in healthcare, and if we attract students who, who make those innovations, um, you know, artificial intelligence, medical devices, those kind of things, then I think we make medicine, the system, a lot more efficient and may not even meet, need as many clinicians as we, we did before. Yeah, I love that because the reason I started this podcast is to encourage more medical students to be open about learning innovation and tech. The medical curriculum, curriculum is super jam-packed and there isn't a lot of space for us to learn about all these amazing tech technologies that are coming into clinical practice, like whether it is generative, generative AI or these medical devices. And it's, I thought that was strange. As clinicians of the future, we should be aware and be learning about this tech. So one of the reasons of starting this podcast was honestly just to inspire as many students as possible so they can be ahead of the curve when there, there, there is this transformative change in the way we're practicing medicine. So definitely love that. And so in terms of now scaling up osmosis, how's it going? So I know, obviously, you've, you're you ramping up production a lot. And I, I, I mean, there's been a lot of changes of the platform in the past uh, year or two. So t tell me, how has that transition been after you've been um, acquired by Elsevier? And now, how has that impacted the growth of the platform? And what are you doing now? Totally. Yeah, it's been awesome. Elsevier has been a wonderful partner um, for ours. And you know, they have a 140-year legacy. They publish Grey's Anatomy and Netters and all these great industry-leading books. Uh, they acquired our, comp our, our sister company, Complete Anatomy, which is the first you know, diverse and, sure. and, and the female models that they've built. And so things that were, were taking us five years to do alone um, have taken us six months or a year. Like They've accelerated us in many ways. So we have a Spanish version. We have a ton of Australian nursing students who use osmosis. Um, so that my one of my favorite pages on osmosis is osmosis.org forward slash world. You can kind of see how people learn about osmosis all over the world. Now with Elsevier, that's grown a lot faster because they already have, you know, I was, I was in Portugal in October. They have someone in Portugal who, who works with the schools in Portugal. So when I got there, you know, they picked me up at the airport and we went to all these schools. Um, so again, things that would have taken osmosis alone a lot longer to do. We've also grown, they've hired a lot more people who've joined the platform, uh, content people, engineers, so we're still working on all of that. One of my favorite things and in initiatives at Osmosis is um, patient education, because I really do think that I, I don't see a future where we have enough, say, endocrinologists to treat every person with diabetes. Right? I just think that's just going to be very hard to accomplish, and also it's not the right way to do it, because one is the supply side, do we have enough endocrinologists and can we keep them in practice long enough to want to, you know, to practice for 40, 50 years the way a lot of uh, older physicians were? Uh, the way healthcare is going, no, it doesn't seem like we can do that. Uh, I think there are changes that will help us. But more importantly, let's look at the demand too. It's not just the supply of endocrinologists, but how do we reduce the demand for diabetes care? We need to help people be healthier. We need to help them change their behavior so they don't get, develop diabetes. They're very proven techniques like the Diabetes Prevention Program, DPP, that can do that. But we need to scale that out. And my friend Sean Duffy at Omada Health has done that from a tech perspective. But some of that's just patient education and engagement. How do we get them younger to eat healthier, to know more about insulin and glucose and, and their diet? And so I'm very excited about osmosis for patient education. And we have a lot of patients who've used our, our, our videos um, and our other content. Now with Elsevier, Elsevier has over 2,500 health systems that they have relationships with. And so we're working on more patient education through their existing um, base for, for that. So I think it's just expanded the amount of things we can do as a company. And uh, hopefully, I'm glad you're noticing, hopefully most of those improvements you're seeing on the platform have been very positive. 
Yeah, definitely very positive. And I know you you guys also partnered with YouTube Health, who I re- recently released a, an episode with. And it's exciting that you guys are pre- producing patient education, the content specifically for patients. So obviously not everyone wants to exclusively listen to their doctor. They want to hear the latest information that is out there. And the ways that are out there at the moment are not easily digestible. They're quite hard for patients to read through or to learn through and to understand what they need to know. And so I love that now Osmosis is ramping up their, their the patient side, the patient aspect, and ramping up content specifically tailored and to be beneficial for patients. Really exciting stuff. And so tell me a bit about the reason now you've gone back to med school, Shiv. You, you clearly have a passion for changing the healthcare system and empowering patients but tell me what is the specific reason why you've gone back to med school i was just going to say you're you're clearly not short of money right as in terms of (laughs) you're the founder of this huge osmosis platform so it's definitely not financially driven so tell me yeah why why med school totally and actually it's funny because because i don't have to worry about like the med school debt or any of that stuff it's actually freed me up to to go back to med school because the, the stress of being a med- medical student, I think, boils under a couple of things. One is the rat race competition, right? Like you're young, you're, you know, artificially competitive with some of your classmates. I think it's gotten better over the years, but it sort of doesn't, it doesn't need to be that way. Yes. It shouldn't be that way. Yeah, um, definitely not. And so I don't, I don't feel that anymore because I've already kind of gone out and done it. Number two, I'm not really stressed about the debt. The median debt of medical school graduates in the U.S. is $200,000. Um, and so, uh, not worried about that. And then the UK was bad. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's bad everywhere, but certainly, um, and so not having to worry about that makes a huge, lifts a huge burden where like, you know, I can just focus on learning. Um, a third reason is that, uh, I'm, I'm more, so I've always wanted to go back and I view it as a way to get, uh, to basically get, get better ideas, right? Like when you're actually in the clinic with patients, and you're seeing how the health system is, you know, works or doesn't work very intimately. That's where you get a lot of ideas. Like the first two years of med school were how I got the idea for osmosis. Um, and so the next two years, hopefully, I'll get some other ideas that can be very helpful. And I'm personally very interested in mental health therapy, psychedelics, and Hopkins is a leader in that space, brain computer interface and artificial intelligence. So I'm looking for those kind of ideas as well. Um, another reason is, um, I get to use osmosis, right? So like I'm going back and using <laughs> using osmosis. And so I feel a lot better about my own studying. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Sort of designed the product and now I'm back <laughs> using it, so. Do you ever get an inception moment where you're just sat there at your desk <laughs> doing some <laughs> medical school um, medical school notes and you're just watching your own platform and you're just like, well. <laughs> I love it, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of cool. And, and the, the funny thing is like my teammates hear from me a lot more in the product because like as I'm watching videos, I'm like, oh, I see a typo here. And I like message them and like, there's a little typo and it, it, they, you know, it's funny, but that was how we made a platform in the first place. That, you know, where are our users? And it kind of got lost in a couple of years um, when I was just being a manager of the company as opposed to being a user. But now I'm back to being a user. So hopefully osmosis will improve even faster because of that. Yeah, definitely. And I, I know the reason I reached out to you is because I logged into osmosis the other day and uh, there was a, a message on my screen. And it was from from you, so I'm assuming you sent out a, a, bulk, a, a bulk message to basically all the users of the platform, and you were talking about the Osmosis Diffusion and Innovation Prize, and I thought it looked fascinating, honestly. So tell me a bit about that, because I'm sure there are listeners out there who will be working on their own innovations, and you can benefit from what you are offering. Totally, and the you know you and people who listen to your podcast, I think, would be great to look at that because you're all, all obviously already interested in. Uh, being an MD plus, you know, going above and beyond and, and thinking innovatively. So um, last year, after we had just joined Elsevier, my sister and I launched a scholarship for high school students named after our parents called the Dr. Mukation of Anita Gaglani Scholarship. So I went through this process of um, basically creating a scholarship, which was a lot of fun and very meaningful. And we awarded those over the last couple of weeks um, to high school students. And then it got me thinking about the fact that you know, I'm going back to med school. I'm going to be pretty busy, as you know, as a med student. Um, and I won't be like day to day helping osmosis spread or certainly like I have innovative ideas for how to improve osmosis, but I won't have as much time to act upon those ideas. Um, and so what better way than to crowdsource some of this? Um, and so given that we had just done a scholarship, it's like, let's go after 
the osmosis learner base, and that could be the med students and nursing students, but also it could be high school students because we have a ton of use osmosis. It could be practicing clinicians who, who use osmosis for their patients or for continuing education and um, launched this prize called Osmosis Founder Diffusion Innovation Award and uh, welcome any, any osmosis learner to apply to one or both of them. The Diffusion Prize is basically meant to help osmosis spread to as many people and schools as possible. So we've had many examples where a student, a motivated student like yourself, will introduce us to their faculty member or their dean. That starts a conversation. And then within a couple of months, the entire school has access to osmosis. Um, and so those are the types of things we're definitely looking for because I want osmosis to spread to as many people because the more learners, the better the platform becomes, et cetera. Um, and also importantly, you, you mentioned YouTube. I loved your episode as well with YouTube Health UK. Um, Thank you. We, uh, we've, they've been a big partner of ours for a long time. And the way we got connected to them was one of our advisors, you know, somebody at YouTube, they connected us. YouTube loved our channel. We're the largest health education channel on YouTube and started funding us to make co content on COVID, combat to misinformation, uh, now we're on rare disease content, et cetera. So um, that's the diffusion part. The innovation part is two questions, uh, two potential prompts. One is how do you, how can you make, how can we make osmosis even better? What are some innovations you have in mind? And the second is how do we make health education better? How do we train more clinicians, get them to be higher quality and keep them in the practice longer? And ideally the ideas are coming using generative AI because that's obviously the hot thing, uh, but not just, it's not like NFTs, like it's, it's here, it's actually creating value. It's something yeah. we're excited about. I've been playing around, I know you have too, with ChatGPT quite a bit and other AI tools. Um, so what are ways that we can use AI tools in osmosis to make it even better? And frankly, I'd be interested in your ideas right now or, or you know, obviously your audience who can reach yeah. out to me on LinkedIn anytime. For sure. I mean, this is something I've spoken with the Nottingham Dean of Med School about. It's just the fact that people who are interested in innovation, working on their own little side hustles at the same time at medical school, there is little support for us. And so there's little room for us to take an afternoon off when we need to, despite, uh, obviously we need to be competent as doctors. We need to make sure we sign off all our DOPS, our WPAs and stuff like that. But there's little support from the university to appreciate the fact that we have this greater vision and we're working on something that is actually for just in general, the betterment of patients or betterment for other clinician students. And it's something I've sat down with the Nottingham Dean of Med School about just providing the support. And it's difficult from their end. They don't really know how to approach this. And so I, I think it, it firstly starts off with the medical school resources they give us, because if they are inefficient resources, then we're taking double the time to go through them and actually learn the resources. If they had very um, easily digestible videos where I'm spending half the time learning the exact same content, then it frees up. I have now double the time than I did before, right? And so this is where osmosis comes in. So I know a lot of universities at the moment, my brother goes to Norwich Medical University and um, they actually provide the osmosis platform for free for all the students, whereas Nottingham doesn't do that. And so it would be great to actually have a conversation with the Nottingham Dean of Med School about this conversation, Shiv, because I think that there would be a lot of value in the the medical students at Nottingham being able to use this platform, utilize this platform for free, because obviously it, it is, it, there's a fee to it. It's, I think it's about $150, right? I'm fortunate enough that I, I was able to pay that, but there are there are some students in, in my cohort who, who aren't able to afford that. And so it would be great firstly to, yeah, to get the university on board to be able to um pay for some of their students to use the osmosis course so this is definitely a conversation we should carry on after um, Shiv. and then in terms of generative ai it's huge right and i think one of the major things is students don't know how to prompt ai so there are a lot of students out there who i've told use chat gpt um and they've used it and they come back to me and say oh it's rubbish like I, I got a, ra a crap response and I try explaining to them the reason you got a crap response is because you gave it a crap prompt. And so I think a big thing now as these gener generative AI large language models are coming into mainstream media is the fact that in the education system, there needs to be some formal education on how to actually prompt a language model because it's what is going to make someone more competitive than the other, someone that knows how to use AI efficiently um, to the best of their ability is going to run laps around someone that doesn't 
And so that I think is a huge thing and something that I'm excited about what Os Os Osmosis is doing when I saw in that little, um, in, in that email you sent, the, 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 the little teaser, it said using generative AI, I got all happy and excited. So yeah, it'll be interesting to firstly hear about stuff you're doing and we can have a conversation from there and I can give my feedback on the ways I've used ChatGPT, for example, in med school and then see the ways that Osmosis is using it. Totally. I love both of those. Thank, thanks for that. And I agree, like, would love to follow up on both of those with you. Um, because I 100% like this is the thing with osmosis, like we aren't just trying to help pass tests, we want to make it more efficient, more enjoyable, help people be less burned out, more collaborative. And then maybe they can use that extra time, like we were using osmosis to make our med school learning more efficient, so we could build osmosis, right? Like it was very like, fly, yeah. a flywheel. But the second, I agree with you 100%. Uh, it's a technology, this t tool is just like any technology, like a calculator or spell check. If you don't know the limits of it, I've met so many students who don't know how to use a calculator that well. They'll just plug in numbers and then like get a result and they won't have like the mental model to understand that that result is way off, right? Like they, they'll add instead of multiply or something like that. Similarly with AI, like garbage in, garbage out. And so I think a series of videos or webinars on, on very specific ways you could be using these tools right now. One of our greatest partners is NYU, New York University. And the dean there is a guy named Mark Triola, super innovative guy helped Osmosis very early on and has been a partner for many years and is helping NYU get into Gen AI and has a sp I saw some slides he was presenting with very specific use cases for medical faculty on how to use these tools to write questions, to do some research, to um, write LinkedIn recommendations. I, you know, I just used one over the weekend to write a recommendation letter for somebody who worked for us. Uh, and so all these recommendation letters, faculty can be helping write, write better with Gen AI. Um, so maybe that's something we could work on Ash too at some point, yeah, yeah. like actual prompt engineering for med students, what that looks like. Definitely. I think it's also, it stemmed the, the, the reason people are, aren't taking the time out to, to learn how to efficiently prompt an AI is because it's almost demonized by the university. The fact that when this platform came out, ChatGPT, rather than the university's initial response was to embrace the technology, embrace the fact that it will be in our lives now, it's not going away. And they they decided to you know what we're we're going to take the stance of just completely banning it. Any students that are found to be using ChatGPT for their um, their exams or whatever, they, it's an immediate um, zero. And so I understand obviously it's a fine line of making sure that students know their stuff and they aren't just getting ChatGPT to do the whole thing. But we're in a post ChatGPT world now, post large language model world where. It doesn't you you don't need to do stuff on your own on your own anymore you have this personal assistant and it's about utilizing this personal assistant to expand and kind of yeah expand your own knowledge base and expand your own potential and so definitely having these ha having prompting webinars for students i think is something that osmosis should definitely be working on and something i think would be of huge value not only just for students but for, honestly for everyone and the amount of doctors who i've spoken to on placements trying to explain to them what chat gpt is and they they say oh i've heard about it but they're, they're a bit skeptical of it as well it, it's just about talking about it normalizing it and just it's, it's a slow progression right and when people start seeing its potential then i think it's really going to kick off and it's just providing those resources to start educating people how to use it um, efficiently. So yeah, tell, tell me a bit about what Osmosis has in the pipeline then. Well, definitely these kind of conversations and on my podcast, the Raise Line podcast, I've been doing a lot to get people like Eric Topol and, and uh, Kareem Lakani, who runs AI for HBS um, on the podcast to start introducing these concepts to more students like, like your podcast, right? Um, as far as the pipeline for Osmosis, uh, the, one of the things I'm obsessed with right now is part is using some of these advanced AI models for real-time or high fidelity language translation. The, the vision of osmosis, the big hairy audacious goal is we educate a billion people by 2025. So, so far we have, even though we have, we have about 3 million YouTube subscribers, 3 million registered learners, many more people have used osmosis videos than that. Uh, you know, it's like in YouTube, how many YouTube videos do you watch where you don't subscribe to the channel? So we've had, we've had over 280 million views of our content. Um, so by 2025, we want to get to over a billion views. And one of the biggest issues is that there's so many people who could benefit from this kind of content who don't speak English, um, you know, or mm. they, they speak Zulu or they speak, uh, you know, Mandarin. And 
right now, even the translations we've been doing are a little, they're always some human feedback, which is important, but they, they, uh, that takes a lot of money and time. And so I'm very excited about tools like DeepL and uh, Eleven Labs, which have shown very high fidelity, even medical content translation. And we could just imagine a YouTube channel where like, you know, YouTube automatically adds captions now to every video. I'm sure our partners at YouTube will like clone our channel into Osmosis Swahili, you know, if we want very quickly. Um, yeah. So, and that'll help us get to the, the billion people by 2025 much faster. Yeah. And it's just maximizing that global impact because the, there aren't the same resources out there. Like, for example, in India, where uh, totally. where I'm from, they don't have the same opportunities. But by providing this global platform where you, we are, you're able to translate it into, say, Hindi or Punjabi, people who are, wouldn't otherwise be able to get say, information will, will be able to um, learn for themselves, which is exciting and it will be completely uh, revolutionary. Uh, yeah. And so in terms of... So there's a couple of AI tools out there. I know before we uh, before we had we had a little discussion, and you actually linked one in the chat about one that would help me for the podcast. And so one I've been using is just um, it's an AI that has learned my voice. And so if there's ever a bit, so it's called Descript. So if there's, Descript. If there's ever, yeah, yeah. We so I've trained it, it to learn my voice. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So if there's ever a point in the podcast where I've stumbled on my words and I just want to change a couple words, I'll just retype it, and Descript will say that um, in my voice, even though I've never said that. Okay. So it'll be interesting to hear. I was going to say, can, <laughs> I ask, know, yeah. can I ask you a question about that? So you've watched, yeah, a lot yeah, of, of course. You watch a lot of Osmosis videos, and one one idea I've been floating to our product team for a couple of months now, but I'm excited about it. Is what if you could take the? We use the script too. What if you could take yeah. your trained the script voice and like snap your fingers, and then every Osmosis video that you watch is in your own voice, or your mom's voice, or someone else in your, that you, like maybe Drake's voice, like we've seen on, you know, the, the, <laughs> would that be interesting, or is it just more of a game? No, I what mean, think? I mean, I think that'd be interesting, maybe more, I, I don't know how much more beneficial that would be, because the voices you have at the moment, I think they're quite, they're, they're quite engaging. Good. Um, in terms of having, wanting to hear Drake's voice while I'm learning, like, anatomy i don't know how useful that's going to be i think it'll be a cool little feature <laughs> but in terms of um something that would actually be of use i'm not sure because also i don't really like the sound of my own voice so i wouldn't want to hear my own voice back what i was um learn yeah like, like doing my anatomy and just learning patient conditions but what i was actually going to ask about that was are you guys working on a way where you can start um training these um ai voices so that you don't have to narrate videos anymore you can just type them out or are you already doing that <laughs> we for certain corrections we do so for example if someone um if we have to like modify a video because it's something the guideline changed and say the voice of artist stopped working with us yes like we want to figure out a way to to make that happen um i've been trying to tell our team too for months like because we hired a lot of voice of artists uh, as contractors or employees that like they've got to figure out how to use these tools to be efficient and like 10x their output with this tool because there's obviously fears around, like, do we need to have accountants? Do we need to have voice voice of artists with all these tools? These are legitimate fears. And uh, we want to be able to, the, the way we're looking at it is more, how do we take the existing talent we have and then 10x their productivity and efficiency uh, as opposed to reducing the number of talent we have? Yeah. And just in terms of sort of your, obviously, your, it's, it's evident speaking to you that you clearly have this drive. Someone that gets firstly gets into medical school and keeps deferring years, starts their own company, the company's osmosis, and considering how successful and global it is, and then actually decide you will not go back to med school, you clearly have this drive. So where did this drive come from, Shiv? And what advice would you give to other student entrepreneurs out there? Well, I think a lot of people like yourself and people listening have the drive too, because you know clearly getting into med school is very difficult. and taking the time to consume content when you could be watching a Netflix show, what, you know, listening to this podcast is obviously indicative that you have some interest and drive. Um, I think a lot of this is a, you know, obviously ancestral, right? Like, you know, this, you know, refugee grandparents. Yeah. And so not only do we feel the, the need to succeed and accomplish for ourselves, I think, but for our family, for like the sort of like the weight of the ancestors on us uh, as, as kind of, spiritual as that sounds, I feel that. Um, I think a lot of it's just passion. Like you find, you start working on something and it becomes an obsession because it's so interesting. And then the more 
success you have in it, the more interesting it becomes because then you can do so many more things. And so it's like, it's definitely the flywheel effect of like the more, you know, more leverage, more resources you have, the more you can do, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but then I've tried over the last year and one piece of advice I'd give to your audience of just being super clear about why I do the things I do, right? Why am I trying to do X, Y, Z? Because a lot of these, there's a great book um, by a guy named Naval Ravikant called The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, which I recommend. He started AngelList. He's one of the most successful Silicon Valley investors out there. And he says, desire is a contract you make with yourself to be unhappy until you get what you want. And a lot of the issues we face right now is a lot of desire comes from society and from parents and from other people, but not yourself. And a lot of people don't understand what they truly want. So they just say, oh, like society thinks you should have a Porsche. So let me get a Porsche. Or society thinks you need to be a doctor. So let, or my parents think I need to be a doctor. So let me be a doctor. So you get all these desires placed on you from sources that you aren't really clear about why. And if you spend a little more time, a lot more time, getting more self-knowledge and self-awareness of what truly makes you tick, what, what you're excited about, you can save yourself a lot of heartache, I think, by pursuing the paths that are most authentic to yourself. So again, that sounds foo-foo right now, but like it's something I've learned over the past decade because a lot of things I've done have been not things that I've necessarily wanted to do myself, but now I'm clearer about what I want. Sure. No, really great advice. You know, while while you were actually speaking that, I just thought of um, another way that generative AI could be used on the on the Emoji platform. I just wanted to run through that. Please. I know we finished that topic. No, no, I would love but, to go. Yeah, I, I was just thinking, so the way I, I, I approach the Osmosis platform, I obviously watch the videos and then do the questions. And a lot of the time when doing the questions, sometimes I won't understand the um, the, the response that has been given. So the explanation, the reason why I got a question wrong. So I think it would be quite cool to have a generative AI chatbot, your personal assistant, who you could ask to clarify. And if there's something you don't get, then get it to explain a bit more in more detail. Um, and then if you still don't get it, ask again, and it can break it down again for you and personalize you learning that way. And then it will almost learn you as a person, ex learn how you like to be taught things, how you like stuff to be explained to you. I think that's the, that's that would be amazing, like a really cool vision. If you guys are working on that at the moment, it'll be yeah, that's super sick as a med student. <laughs> totally. I, I, I don't know if you know this, but a bunch of our team used to work at Khan Academy. That's where we got the videos. And, oh, and then right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much better. So I had Sal, Sal Khan on the podcast like two years ago, and then he just last week gave this great TED talk ta showing how, how they've integrated a GPT-4 based uh, chatbot assistant in Khan Academy with a wrapper. Oh, wow. Right? So you aren't just using generic GPT-4 or chat GPT, you're using a, a yeah. wrapper which has yeah, more prompts yeah. and, and doesn't let you cheat, right? Because you can go into GPT and paste a, a math question and it'll solve it for you and tell you. Whereas if you use it in Khan Academy, it'll say, actually, I can't, I'm not going to tell you the answer, but this is how you think through it. Like, let's start talk, working through it together. And so I'd recommend everyone watches TED Talk because exactly what they've done is something I think every well, learning platform can and should do at this point, including Osmosis. Yeah, definitely. I'll definitely be linking that in the podcast for the listeners. And so, Shiv, it's been amazing having you. And just before we wrap up the podcast, um, any last final thoughts? Any, I guess... You, you've given some amazing entrepreneurial advice in your, your journey and just hearing about what you're doing is very inspirational. But just for anyone out there who is a student, med student or any any student who's just looking to start their entrepreneurial journey, let's keep it brief, just a short, snappy two-liner. Yeah, just biased towards action. I would say biased towards action. So if you've taken the time to listen to this podcast, just add me on LinkedIn right away. Email me at shivadosmosis.org. Feel free to connect. You took the time to listen. Why not just connect? So that's one one thing I would share. Yeah, amazing. So Shiv, it's been my pleasure having you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Ash, thanks so much. I uh, love what you're doing and look forward to being in touch.